This is a second lecture on plant senescence from October 14th, 2020. And we're going to focus mostly on the initiation signals for plant senescence in this lecture. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how membrane degradation can initiate leaf senescence, as well as differences in light intensity and differences in um, specific plant hormones. So we already had talked about how leaf senescence involves the degradation of multiple membranes. Um, one of the first things that happens during the initiation phase of leaf senescence is that chloroplasts are degraded. Um, and chloroplast membranes actually degrade first because there's this weird hierarchy of membrane degradation within leaves. Um, where the chloroplasts membranes degrade first and then ultimately, um, mitochondrial, as well as the vacuole, central vacuole membranes degrade last. Um, but regardless of whether we're talking about the chloroplast or the mitochondrial or the central vacuole membranes, the process of um, membrane degradation within leaves during senescence is pretty much the same. You have a functional membrane which re receives the initial senescent signal and then begins to express lipases which degrade the phospholipids of the membrane and proteases which start to degrade the proteins embedded within that membrane as well. And that leads to these unstable regions within the membrane as well as an increase in the uh, selective permeability. So once the lipases start to degrade phospholipids, the fatty acids that are um, part of those phospholipids remain in the membrane. And in the beginning of senescence, um, these fatty acids are actually converted into sterols and waxy esters, which are less harmful to the membrane overall. But later, as leaf senescence progresses, the unstable regions um, and the lipases that actually continue to degrade phospholipids um, release even more and more free fatty acids, they're no longer converted into these kind of safer sterols and esters. And the free fatty acids can actually create holes within the membrane, making them even more unstable. And so it sort of leads to this vicious um, cycle, right, where you have unstable regions generated by free fatty acids in the membrane that generate holes, um, and that increased permeability leads to even more unstable regions, even more fatty acids, even more instability, and more holes within the membrane. And at a certain point, there are so many holes within the membranes that they're no longer able to be selectively permeable, and they lose um, that ability, and they also um, lose the ability to maintain any electrochemical gradients that exist across membranes. And after that, the total membrane is basically disintegrated and there's a loss of membrane integrity and a process what's known as cellular decompartmentalization where the organelles fragment and fall apart. And what um, I should bring your attention to is that this loss of electrochemical gradients as well as this kind of decompartmentalization steps are part of stochastic senescence, or that random, um, unregulated senescence. Whereas everything before that, um, including the degradation by proteases and lip lipases of the plasma membrane, is part of the program senescence for leaves, um, or the regulated part. And that distinction really happens here because once electrochemical gradients are lost, there's no way to control or measure the true rate um, at which senescence is going to occur. Sometimes it might happen faster or slower depending on how quickly the permeability of these membranes is lost. Um, and so that makes it a little bit more stochastic of a process. Okay, and so we've talked about how um, leaves go through several stages of senescence. They have a programmed as well as a stochastic senescence um, they enter into an initiation phase followed by degradation and then termination. But what actually triggers or initiates 
the senescence in the first place, right? So there's a senescent signal that starts all the stuff off. Um, and one signal that does seem to affect senescence and initiate it is the intensity of light. And so plants have a particular um, property known as phototropism, where they will grow towards light in order to improve their photosynthesis and make more food. And this process is controlled by several receptors called the phototropins, right? And so in plants that are no longer growing, like this plant here, which is growing actively towards the light, um, in a mature plant, they're no longer doing that. And so the leaves at the top of the plant are technically more photosynthetically active than those leaves that are at the bottom. They're more exposed to sunlight. The plant is no longer growing. It can't grow in response to light like this plant in the GIF here. And what's important, I guess, to remind you of is that in order for plants to do photosynthesis, um, they need to absorb specific wavelengths of visible light. And chlorophyll, or the pigment in chloroplasts, that's responsible for absorbing that light energy and ultimately converting it into sugar, to um, ultimately convert it into sugar. Is, um, chlorophyll best absorbs two wavelengths of light, blue light and red light. And the blue light, blue light promotes release of a hormone called auxin, which is a growth hormone. And red light promotes photosynthesis. And in particular, it's shown that um, far red light is actually worse at promoting photosynthesis, whereas regular normal red light uh, or higher intensity red light is better at, photo at promoting photosynthesis. Or a decreasing intensity in the red light decreases photosynthesis. So once again, that shorter wavelength, high intensity red light is better at photosynthesis. And that far red, lower intensity light is worse. Right. And so if we look at this plant here, what we'll notice is that there's actually going to be more of the high intensity light at the tops of plants. And more of that far red or lower intensity light towards the bottom. And that means, in terms of photosynthesis, that the leaves at the top of the plant are continuously doing photosynthesis more effectively because they have access to better light. Whereas the leaves at the bottom are more exposed to the far red light. And that far red light means those leaves are not doing photosynthesis as effectively. And so what this means for senescence is usually that these leaves at the bottom of the plant that are not um, effectively kind of utilizing photosynthesis that they can't do it as well, will actually trigger senescence in the leaves at the top. And that's because those leaves at the top have no idea what's going on in the rest of the plant, right? They're totally fine. They can do all the photosynthesis they want. They have access to light. But these leaves at the bottom don't. And so they need to be that sensor for the rest of the plant. And so um, a decrease in photosynthesis here can actually lead to senescence within the whole plant. And some other factors that affect senescence are the plant hormones. Um, specifically, one hormone that we're gonna discuss is ethylene, which is um, a pretty simple hormone. It is a gas, and it's usually associated with promoting fruit ripening, um, as well as leaf abscission. And so ethylene gas is the reason why you can kind of put a banana next to some avocados to ripen them. Bananas give off a lot of ethylene gas and they promote fruit ripening, right? And abscission is that regulated um, separation of leaves from the stems of plants. And that is also controlled by ethylene, um, as well as auxin, right? And so auxin is a growth hormone. And normally to maintain a leaf, auxin levels would be high. But when auxin levels deplete, it allows ethylene to kind of become the main um, signaling hormone. And that ethylene promotes separation of the leaf from the stem. And it does that in kind of an interesting way. 
um, because ethylene concentration within the leaves increases during senescence. Right. And at the kind of abscission point between the leaf and the stem, there's an abscission zone of cells. And what ethylene does, or C2H4 does, is it actually promotes kind of a slicing of this layer of cells um, in the leaf, between that kind of leaf and stem, and development of a protective layer on the stem there to prevent any damage after the leaf is removed. And so you can see um, ethylene here. And we know that ethylene concentration increases during leaf senescence. Um, but what's not clear is that ethylene is actually the cause of leaf senescence because there is an expression of kind of the machinery that makes ethylene, right? The enzymes responsible for its biosynthesis. Expression of those enzymes increases during senescence as well. But it's not clear that ethylene is the cause of senescence or senescence is happening and ethylene concentration increases as a result. Um, and so studies into that are still kind of ongoing to determine if ethylene increase is the cause of senescence or just a consequence of it. Um, and ABA is another plant hormone that induces leaf senescence. It's usually expressed in response to stress, particularly drought stress. And so ABA has several different functions. It closes stomata to reduce water loss, which is great for stressful drought times. It increases seed dormancy, so seeds don't um, germinate in the presence of no water. And it also inhibits cell growth um, during times of drought and stress, right? So it's good for stress resistance. In addition, in at least in relation to senescence, ABA enhances the effects that ethylene has on abscission, right? And so it basically amps up the ability of ethylene to um, abscise or regularly cut leaves um, or remove leaves from the stem. And finally, there are plant hormones that actually can affect senescence in the opposite way. So ABA and ethylene both promote senescence, but cytokinins, which is another group of plant hormone, actually delays senescence. And cytokinins are um, basically released in response to nitrogen levels. And so more nitrogen means more cytokinins. And usually then, since they promote growth, means more growth. Um, and cytokinins can actually um, delay senescence. And so if you look at these two plants here, they're tobacco plants. There is a wild type plant on the left and a plant that overexpresses cytokinins or on the left, sorry, wild type on the right, overexpression of cytokinins on the left. And you can see that these leaves and these plants at the same kind of day 14, I believe, or day 10 after, um, they're basically the same age plants, but they look um, completely different, right? Because the leaves are not undergoing senescence when there's overexpression of cytokines. Kinins. And that concentration of cytokinins increases during early senescence and then decreases during the late part. And that's because the expression of enzymes that degrade cytokinins increases at the end of senescence as well. And you can imagine that this is sort of important to have a high level of cytokinins at the beginning because plants need senescence to happen correctly because it's part of their reproductive life cycle. And so the concentration of cytokinins is high at the beginning to ensure plants can undergo senescence correctly. And then once they sort of know that all these processes have happened that need to happen, the concentration of cytokinins can go down and senescence can continue. And that concentration depletes because um, the leaves begin to express degradation of cytokine machinery. 